Hello, my name is Alex de Guzman, and this is my critical assignment on penicillin. Penicillin is by far one of the most influential chemical substances to have come out of medical science. Prior to its discovery, one of the biggest killers of individuals was the bacterial infection. Like whether it be something such as pneumonia, or even a wound or a cut that became infected, pretty much if you had a bacterial infection, you had to just hope and pray that you survived it. But with penicillin came a new age in medicine. Penicillin is the first antibiotic. And what is an antibiotic? Well, it is a substance or even a semi-synthetic substance that is either produced from or derived from a microorganism such as maybe a fungi or, or another bacteria. And what it basically does is that when this chemical compound is in a diluted solution, it has a tendency to inhibit or even outright kill other organisms, microorganisms to be exact. So how was penicillin discovered? So the individual that is uh, attributed with the discovery of penicillin is a man by the name of Alexander Fleming. He's a Scottish uh, bacteriologist for St. Mary's Hospital in London. And to be even more precise, his uh, field of research was in the treatment of bacterial infections, or rather to try and discover a way to treat bacterial infections without hurting the human tissue. So how did he find penicillin? Well, simply, it was by accident. But it was an accident that led him to use the scientific method to figure out what this new substance that he accidentally discovered was. So to begin the scientific method, one has to observe something. So what did Alexander Fleming observe? Well, in uh, September 3, 1928, Alexander Fleming was in his lab. He was cleaning out some old samples, old petri dishes, old cultures, when he stumbled upon something very interesting and unique. One of the dishes that, uh, that he was about to throw away, he noticed something, something odd. Well, in some parts of that dish, he saw these yellow opaque masses, which were bacterial growths, bacterial colonies, just growing in the culture. But he also noticed that there was some mold growing in another portion of that dish. And around that mold, no sign of bacteria whatsoever. In fact, instead of those masses, what he saw were these drop-like, um, these dew-like droplets. And well, this observation led him to, to a question. Why in this single dish are there portions that have bacteria in it and other portions that do not? And so he went ahead and made a hypothesis. Considering the fact that there was mold growing in that dish, and that was the only area where there were no bacteria showing up, he hypothesized that the mold had some antibiosis capabilities and qualities to it. Antibiosis, in case one isn't familiar, is uh, it just simply means that there's antagonism between one organism and another organism. In this case, there's antagonism between the mold, the fungi, and versus the bacteria. So naturally, when you have a hypothesis, you have to test it, you have to experiment. The experiment itself was quite simple, actually. First of all, Fleming and his colleagues were able to identify 
that mold as a very rare strain of penicillin known as penicillin notatum. And so, what Fleming did, he went ahead and cultivated that mold in a fresh and clean petri dish. And during that process, he discovered that that mold was producing a liquid. And as it turned out, it wasn't the mold itself that was working against the bacteria, but the liquid that it was producing. So for the experiment, he went ahead and, and gathered that, gathered and harvested that, that liquid. He called it mold juice because he couldn't think of any other name. And he would expose that mold juice to various kinds of bacteria, both common as well as pathogenic. Once these experiments were completed, Fleming came to two conclusions. The first was that this mold juice, as he calls it, this mold juice was extremely effective on just about almost every bacteria he exposed it to. It was, success, it was a successful test and the bacteria was eradicated. However, it does come with a caveat, which is the point two. And this, and this is, it was only effective on gram-positive bacteria. When exposed to gram-negative bacteria, there was no effect. But even so, this was a huge breakthrough. Because up to this point, there was nothing that could even treat gram-positive bacterial infections. So it was still worth something and Fleming continued to pursue it. So he went ahead and he he continued to run tests testing the toxicity of it as well as the stability and eventually it, he moved into doing human trials. And so there were two cases the first case was a minor bacterial infection, and the penicillin worked like a charm, completely eradicating it. That patient was healed. However, the second case, that patient had a much more serious case of bacterial infection, and unfortunately, the penicillin was not able to help her. So from this, Fleming learned that the penicillin just wasn't concentrated enough. Like keep in mind that he is not a chemist, but a biologist. And he just wasn't able to refine, purify this substance as much as possible to make it more effective. And so <clears throat> he tried, he and other colleagues tried to purify it with what they knew. But ultimately, the methods of the time and their knowledge, their chemical knowledge in that sense, it just wasn't up to the task. So Fleming had no choice but to go ahead and just uh, finish the report and hang up the project and wait and hope that someone more capable than him would take interest in it and pursue it. Fortunately for Alexander Fleming, two scientists did take interest about a decade later. Their names were Howard Florey and Ernst Chain. They were scientists at Oxford, and they read the report, and they were interested in trying to find a way to purify the penicillin. And so, their initial attempts revealed something important. It revealed that penicillin was in fact an unstable enzyme. And like pretty much any enzyme, when in a solution, when you try to concentrate it through evaporation, it has a tendency to lose its potency. The reason is because during the evaporation process, both the enzyme as well as the deactivating substances used, they concentrate at the exact same time, which negates both of them. 
So these two wanted to try something a little different. They wanted to try a brand new method at the time, which was a sublimation through freeze drying. Sublimation pretty much is taking a substance in a solid state and moving it to its gaseous state through sublimation and doing all of that without turning it into a liquid. And so <clears throat> both uh, Chain and Flory, they took the penicillin, brought it to its uh, solid state, which isolated the enzymes from the deactivating substances. And from the solid state, they sublimated it into a gaseous form. And since the deactivating substances were isolated from the enzymes, the enzymes stayed intact and they retained their potency. And so these two managed to successfully produce a purified and concentrated form of penicillin. And they proceeded, proceeded to do more tests to prove its potency, which, which they discovered that in this form, this penicillin was a lot stronger than the crude form that Fleming used during his own experiments. And once these tests were finalized in about 1941, they sent their results to the U.S. so that the United States could mass produce the, the new antibiotic. Because Britain was in the middle of a war, World War II, and unfortunately had their hands tied as is. And that's pretty much how penicillin was discovered and came to be. So what are some of the properties of penicillin? Considering the fact that there are a wide variety of versions of penicillin as well as a wide variety of derivatives of penicillin, we'll go ahead and limit our statistics to the penicillin G form of it. And so I'll go ahead and start by just posting the chemical formula right about here, as well as the molecular structure about here. But as you can see, penicillin consists of 16 carbons, 18 hydrogens, uh, 2 nitrogens, 4 oxygens, and 1 sulfur. It has a molecular weight of 334.39 grams per mole, as well as a melting point of uh, 214 to 217 degrees Celsius. In addition to that, it also has a boiling point of 663.3 degrees Celsius at 760 millimeters of mercury. In terms of solubility, there are a few substances that it is soluble with. Water is one of the most important, and it has a solubility of 210 milligrams per liter. And then there's also alcohol, glycerol, and DMSO. And uh, penicillin has a solubility with those three at uh, 71 milligrams per milliliter at 25 degrees Celsius. And then there is ethanol as well. And with that one, penicillin has a solubility of less than one milligram per milliliter at 25 degrees Celsius. It is important to note, though, that with, with um, petroleum ether, it has absolutely no solubility. So, in terms of its physical form, you'll often find penicillin as a solid. More specifically, as an amorphous white powdery substance. Once they produce it into that powder, it'll often be applied and given to patients in either a tablet form or sometimes as a serum to be um, injected intravenously. So in terms of chemical reactions for penicillin, one of the most important processes is hydrolysis. As we know, hydrolysis is simply breaking apart a polymer by adding water. So let's just go ahead and illustrate this. As we know, a polymer is simply a substance that consists of multiple bound monomers. So let's just say we have a polymer that consists of two monomers that are bound together. 
All right, so we have this polymer over here, and it consists of two monomers, and they're bound. So what happens when we add water, when we add H2O? So what happens is, basically, the polymer breaks apart. And then it's now two monomers. And one monomer takes the double hydrogen from the water, while the other monomer takes the oxygen. Now the question then is, why is this important to penicillin? And to understand that, we have to understand how penicillin works when it attacks a bacteria. So unlike other cells, like animal cells or human cells, bacteria do have a dense protective cell wall. To be more precise, this cell wall protects the internal environment of the bacteria from the external environment. The problem, however, is this. Bacteria is constantly multiplying. And what that means is that that cell wall is being constantly breached. So to remedy this, the protein struts of the bacteria are constantly snapping together the peptidoglycan of the cell wall. This pretty much closes any gaps, any holes that might be in the cell wall, and it works pretty well. So what penicillin does is that it inhibits these protein struts from being able to snap those peptidoglycans shut. And that, in turn, leads to the cell wall being compromised with multiple gaps and holes and openings in general. And that, in turn, leads to osmosis, where water from the external environment is rushing in to the cell, into the bacteria. And then that finally leads to the bacteria bursting from the inside out, and thereby killing it. I know this seems a rather roundabout way of explaining a chemical reaction, but it is of the utmost importance for us to understand this. That way we can understand why exactly the scientists are using hydrolysis for this process. So let's go ahead and just begin by pulling up the molecular structure of the penicillin, and we'll go from there. So looking at the left, you'll notice that there is a branch with an R. That R, it doesn't refer to a particular chemical or anything specific. It's actually more of a placeholder. It's a variable. And thus, it's not very integral to penicillin. However, what is integral to penicillin is that square you, you can see in the center. That is what we call the beta-lactam ring. Remember how I said that penicillin Penicillin, it inhibits the protein struts from snapping the bacteria's um, peptidoglycans. Well, the reason it inhibits those protein struts is because that beta-lactam ring fits exactly in those protein struts. And once the protein strut is occupied, it can't bind to anything else. So here is where the problem begins. As is common knowledge, antibiotics have a tendency to lose their potency, especially when overused. The reason is because bacteria over time can develop a resistance to those substances. In the case of penicillin, the bacteria was able to identify the penicillin and develop countermeasures. So scientists have had to recraft various antibiotics, such as penicillin, in order to overcome those obstacles. And in recrafting, parts of the original substance must be broken apart. In the case of penicillin, that R, that variable that we mentioned earlier, that can be removed without too much uh, detriment. However, what must absolutely be retained for penicillin to be penicillin is that, uh, that beta-lactam ring. Again, remember the protein struts, they have a very specific shape, and that beta-lactam ring is a very precise shape that fits into that protein strut. 
And so this is where hydrolysis comes in. And this is pretty much how the scientists did it. What we have here is a chemical equation demonstrating the effects of hydrolysis on penicillin. On the left side of the arrow, we have the reactants. These are the substances that will be used to create this chemical reaction. On the right side, however, we have the products or the substances that will be created by the reaction. Going back to the reactant side, what we have here is water, H2O, being added to penicillin. And this will cause hydrolysis. So what will happen next is that the variable branch will be broken off from the main structure of penicillin. To be more precise, when the R is broken off, it will take one of the hydrogens from the imidogen, the NH, as well as uh, take the carbon monoxide. But not only that, because this is hydrolysis, that carbon monoxide will become carbon dioxide because it will take the oxygen from the water as well. And so, this structure will be produced. Looking back at the water, since it lost its oxygen to the variable branch, creating carbon dioxide, the remaining dihydrogen will attach itself to the remaining piece of the penicillin. In fact, when it does this, that whole structure will take on a new name, the 6-aminopenicillinic acid, or 6-APA for short. And that's why we have the results that we have on the right side of the equation. So before we go, let's go ahead and take one last look at the 6-APA structure. If you notice, the beta-lactam ring is completely intact. And as we've uh, talked about before, it's this structure that is needed to lock down those protein struts of the various bacteria that penicillin deals with. So it's at this point that chemists can take the 6-APA structure and then create various derivatives and variations of penicillin to counteract the bacterial resistance. And that's why hydrolysis is a very important chemical reaction used on penicillin.